Jessica's Instagram account has reached millions of people. Why did she call it Blessed by Cancer? And what was Jessica's heart behind this Instagram account and the content that she was creating throughout her suffering? Cancer ended up being a blessing for Jessica's soul. This woman was so prepared for death. Her priest who gave her her last rites told me, I don't think I've ever met anyone that prepared. Seeing a woman use her talents and give them all to God, and then seeing what happens when you do that, she's just proof that any talent you might have, if you give it to our Lord and do His will as perfect as you can, incredible things can happen and that's what happened here you have to have that trust that our Lord is in control of everything so as ugly as suffering can get as uncertain as it can get as dark as it can get there's always glory if you participate in our Lord's will and pick up your cross and keep going hey everybody welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast we have a treat today we're sitting down with Lamar Hanna who is the widower the husband of Jessica Hanna she is the creator behind the popular Instagram account called Blessed by Cancer. Jessica passed away just a few months ago, and Lamar is now on a journey to share her life and the incredible lessons of love and trust that she shared with the world throughout her life and in her death. In this interview, we talk about what it means to actually prepare for death. We talk about navigating suffering and maintaining peace, the impact that cancer had on the Hannah family, including their four young children, but how they navigated that and discovered an even deeper love and even peace despite the suffering. You're not gonna wanna miss this episode. Please share this episode with anyone that you know who may be going through a hard time, who may be wrestling with suffering themselves, who knows someone who's going through a hard time. I think they will be very encouraged and consoled by the words that Lamar has to share. Don't forget, as always, to subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts or watch them on YouTube. Make sure that you give us five stars. That helps the show reach more people. We really, really appreciate it, guys. And before we dive in with our conversation with Lamar Hanna, I need to thank our sponsors. A huge thank you to Seven Weeks Coffee. Seven Weeks Coffee is organic, small batch, low acid, ethically sourced coffee that is absolutely delicious. What I love about Seven Weeks Coffee is it's not only delivered right to your door, this is America's pro-life coffee company. In fact, when you order sevenweekscoffee.com, 10% of all of the money that you spend goes directly to pregnancy resource centers to help moms and babies in need. In fact, right now, sevenweekscoffee.com is doing a huge fundraise right now to hit a half a million dollars donated to pregnancy resource centers. And particularly, they want to purchase ultrasound machines so that mothers can see their baby for the first time. Did you know that at seven weeks, the baby is the size of a coffee bean? That's the name, sevenweekscoffee.com. So join Seven Weeks Coffee in their mission to help mothers see their baby on ultrasound and choose life for their babies by going to sevenweekscoffee.com today, signing up for a coffee subscription, get some delicious coffee right to your doorstep, and help support moms and babies in need. That's sevenweekscoffee.com, and you can use the code LILA at checkout for 10% off your order. That's the code LILA at checkout for 10% off your order. And if you join the Heartbeat Club, becoming a monthly subscriber to get coffee directly delivered to your door, this delicious coffee, you can get up to 25% off your first order using the code Lila at checkout. Are you taking your multivitamin? Are you taking any vitamins? Well, whether you're taking them right now or you need to start taking them, you need to check out weheartnutrition.com. Weheartnutrition.com is a pro-life company, a family-owned business that completely sources its vitamins in the United States. Weheartnutrition.com's vitamins use the highest quality research-backed ingredients in their most bioavailable form, which means the body can actually absorb the nutrition. Did you know that most of the multivitamins that you buy at the store are owned by conglomerates that are pro-abortion, that support Planned Parenthood and other pro-abortion causes. Not so with We Heart Nutrition. WeHeartNutrition.com gives a full 10% of all of their profits back to the pro-life movement supporting moms and babies in need. When you buy vitamins from WeHeartNutrition.com, you know that you're not just getting vitamins that are the highest quality and research-backed, but you are getting vitamins that are made here in the USA and giving back to the pro-life movement to support moms and babies in need. What I also love about We Heart Nutrition is they create vitamin packages specifically for where you are at in your life. For women, they have the everyday vitamin package. They have vitamin packages if you are hoping to conceive or if you're prenatal or postnatal, premenopausal or postmenopausal. What you need, they've got it to target the needs of your body and make sure that you have the nutrition nutrition that you need. So go check out weheartnutrition.com today. Use the code Lila at checkout for a full 20% off your order. In addition, weheartnutrition.com offers a 60-day no questions asked return period. So if you're unhappy with the product in any way, you can send it right back. Check them out today. That's weheartnutrition.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 20% off your order. Lamar Hanna, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Thanks for having me, Lila. You have an incredible story and your family is so inspiring and your beautiful wife 
has been inspiring for me to me for well over a year when I first discovered her Instagram account and learned her story. So thank you so much for sharing her life with so many people. Uh, I can't say enough about her. I'm sure we'll get into that, but yeah, <laughs> she was awesome. She, she absolutely is. So I'd love to start with just your background and your, how you met Jessica, your courtship, how you guys met and married. Yeah. So, uh, I, w I wouldn't call it a traditional courtship, but yeah, we, we both met in grad school. Uh, at that point, individually in our lives, we were in grad school, pretty much born and raised Catholic, both of us, but pretty much I'd call us Kino, C-I-N-O, Catholics in name only. We pretty much uh, went to Holy, uh, we went to Sunday Mass, and that's pretty much it. I mean, we um, we pretty much put our careers before everything, and um, we didn't really do much extra prayers, frequent sacraments, learn our catechisms, but uh, we happened to meet, uh, it was a mutual friend, connected us uh at a, uh, to be dates at a wedding. I met her at this wedding. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that caught my eye was she it was a family style meal. She made her own plate and then she made uh, her friend's plate. And, and I said, who's that for? She said, it's a friend who's late coming. And that, that just stuck with me. I'm like, this woman is a caring woman. She's empathetic. Like she, everybody's mm -hmm. busy having fun and she's making a plate for someone else. <laughs> so that, that quality that I was able to catch caught my eye. And uh, she, I mean, she was like that for all the time I ever knew her, but um, it was, you know, it was, it was definitely divine providence, how we ended up getting married because from that point, you know, it's not, it wasn't like a fairy tale story. we like, we lost touch. We got back in touch two years later and, um, just all there, the way that it all happened. If I go into details, you'd be like, there's no way that this wasn't God's plan. Um, mm. because it was almost like, almost like a fluke how we got back together, but we did. And, uh, we ended up getting married and, um, you know, uh, our first eight years of marriage, uh, I would say we probably continued that C-I-N-O lifestyle, Catholic in name only. We, we, we went to Sunday Mass, but at, in that, we both had shared this desire to open businesses and be successful in business. And um, we ended up doing that. We ended up opening a few businesses, managing them. Uh, we still have these businesses to this day, um, but at, it was at the expense of our, our faith. We pretty much put, took, a, it took a back seat and to the point where we even mm -hmm. kind of delayed having children in the beginning, something we both regretted mm -hmm. much later on. Uh, so, you know, yes, we did have successful businesses and God bless us with that, but we weren't really living our vocations and there, there, you know, there was an underlying, like something missing, you know, in our lives. And so that was like our first eight years of marriage. And by that point we had three kids and then that takes us to 2020 where with the lockdowns where like many people, when the sacraments were taken away, it opened every, a lot of people's eyes to what, you know, you don't know what you got till it's gone. And, uh, when the sacraments mm -hmm. were gone from us. We really, it almost, it almost gave us this grace to yearn for them more. And uh, when the masses came back, we fled to the traditional Latin mass and never looked back. Um, and from that point on, it was really a turning point in our lives. Um, I would say that's when everything changes. That, that, that's when everything changed. That's when the graces started flowing in our lives. Uh, we finally were practicing our Catholic faith as God intended for us. Um, you know, I, I would say to some people who are struggling to get to that starting point, I would say like the only way I can explain it is supernatural grace. Um, mm -hmm. You have to have that desire initially yourself to want to become a saint. But once you have that desire, that's step one. God will give you the graces you need to get there. And so, but you do, you do need help. Um, you know, our ladies, the mediatrics of all graces. So I would say to anybody out there, start with a daily rosary. Then you could progress to more mm -hmm. devotions like the Brown Scapular Miraculous Medal. But um, that happened with us. You know, we, we started spending appropriate time in mental prayer. We started catechizing our children properly. Uh, we dove into the saints, church history. I always had a book by my bed. I never used to read. Um, it was always, an, I tried to keep an edifying book by my bed to, to have, you know, so you have edifying thoughts when you go to bed. Catechism, Catechisms of Trent. I, I read that cover to cover. Um, another great book uh, that was great, a nighttime reading was Terror of Demons by Kennedy Hall. I love that book. It, it was mm -hmm. great. It's great. I recommend it for any head of household, any man of the house. Um, but yeah, devotions, uh, beginning to attend mass more than just Sunday. And I mention all this because not just to promote the traditional Latin mass, but really that was the catalyst for Jessica and I, God knew that we were to face a battle just six months later after we started. And he was giving us all the tools we needed to face this battle. And I truly believe looking back at a bird's eye view of everything that happened, um, if we hadn't had that turning point that summer, uh, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I don't know if Jessica would have had the graces she needed to, to get through what we got through. So I, I always like to just uh, mention that because um, it was so important in our lives. 
Did you have any inkling during that time, this is, I think, during pandemic or post-pandemic when you're diving more deeply into your faith, that there was going to be a big trial to come? No, no. I mean, we just, it was summer 2020. Uh, we were just thankful to be back in mass and things were starting to open up a little bit. And um, obviously, I mean, never, we never would have thought. I mean, you, nobody ever thinks that, right? And, and I, I was going to touch on that a little later, but, you know, you, a lot of people don't think and don't realize that we're on borrowed time. I mean... Um, we know not the hour, like it says in scripture, uh, we must attain our salvation in fear and trembling. And yeah, even then, even though we were still like early on in our journey, then we still never, I think, I don't think we got to that point yet where we, we had that real, like this could ever happen to us. And then it did. When you, uh, and Jessica were diving more deeply into your faith, were there some, you mentioned some things like rosary and reading the catechism. Were there some family prayer routines that you did together that you felt were really opening your family up to graces. 100%, yeah. So the daily rosary became our routine. We still do to this day. I do it with the kids. Anybody who has young kids knows it's, it's, it's if, mm -hmm. if, if anything, it's a penance in and of itself. Um, but uh, I would say, you know, any parents with young children stick with it because as they get a little bit older, it starts to stick with them and, and they become, you know, mm -hmm. it becomes part of their lives. Um, that was the first one. And then, uh, we did the first Saturdays. That's something we still to this day. Um, mm. you know, our lady of Fatima made it very clear, uh, to us, uh, what she would want us to do. And, and our lady, you know, when, when God's mom speaks, I listen, that's how I, that's basically <laughs> how I, how I view it. So a lot of Marian devotions that we practice, uh, as a family, um, you know, the, the brown scapular, my, my kids wear the brown scapular. Um, and then there was the catechism. So the catechism, uh, we did the Baltimore Catechism um, cover to cover a couple times with my older two kids. And uh, I just noticed, I, I do it once a week, just on Sundays. In addition to the homeschooling, I would just do it an additional, just my own, you know, uh, kind of random one. And uh, they just loved talking. I noticed that these kids had so many questions. It was pretty incredible. Mm. And before we ever did that, you know, it was, that was like a big part of missing in their lives. So catechizing your kids, it's a, it's a great way to bond with your children, but also like, that also prepared them, I believe, for what happened uh, because we had that like already line of communication and they had that understanding, that baseline understanding of, you know, eternity and suffering. And um, so, yeah, the, the bare minimum I'd say is daily rosary, if, any, if I make a mm -hmm. suggestion and um, catechizing your children. Those two are so huge. What were the, can you share the circumstances of Jessica's first diagnosis? Yep. So, um, so about September, 2020, she noticed a, an indentation on her right breast. She got it checked out. They said it was all clear. A couple of weeks later, we got pregnant with Thomas, our fourth. And then a, a few weeks after that, she went to her OBGYN and said, and he asked anything new, anything interesting happened. She said, yeah, there was this dent I found in my breast. And they said it was all clear. And the OB actually told her, maybe just get it rechecked. And then she did. And then uh, when she did, uh, at 14 weeks, December 16, 2020, uh, it was diagnosed as cancerous. So that's how everything started. Um, Jessica promptly, as she always did, she was an intelligent, uh, very intelligent woman and um, very research-based. I mean, we have a medical background, so uh, evidence-based research, and um, but but with a pro-life, see, that's, that's, that's the thing. Um, she, she sought out uh, pro-life, Sort resources that help women who are pregnant with their child who have cancer and treatment options. And uh, there's a there's an organization called Hope for Two, and they led Jessica to Dr. Elise Cardonic, who's a saint of a woman, excellent doctor who spent Christmas Eve spent a couple hours with Jessica pro bono and went over all the treatment options she has, pharmacological, mm -hmm. non pharmacological, conventional, non conventional, as a woman who's pregnant with cancer. And, um, you know, at that point, we didn't know how severe the cancer was, but Jessica, being Jessica, she had a notebook full of notes prepared. And um, I mentioned that because, you know, there are resources out there, and those are just two, but there are resources out there um, for people. Um, so we then went to her first surgeon appointment, and that surgeon uh, made a comment that really rubbed us the wrong way, where um, the surgeon said, you know, we can do surgery earlier and if you lose the baby, that might be better than to do surgery a little later and lose the baby at 24 weeks and have a preemie in NICU or have a preemie in NICU instead of, it's better to lose the baby than have a baby in NICU, basically is what she said. And that was kind of, I remember shaking my head and Jessica was floored by that. We found a different surgeon, needless to say, but um, a few weeks after that at 19 weeks, 
right after we saw an ultrasound of beautiful Thomas moving, <laughs> maternal fetal medicine doctor, uh, first, first appointment with him, first words out of his mouth, just so you know, before we discuss anything, you should know that you have the option to terminate this pregnancy. Those were his words. Wow. This is the doctor supposed to care for, you know. So those were, that was 19 our, weeks. In 19 weeks. And we just saw moving on the ultrasound. It's pretty incredible. It's, it was mind boggling. I and mean, we were really upset. Jessica actually gave him a piece of her mind. And um, needless to say, we. What did she say? What did she say to the doctor? She said, why would you need to tell me that? What, why? She said, I just want to know why. I mean, I mm -hmm. understand you have to, but why would you tell me? He said, well, that's protocol. You know, some women need to know they have that option. And then she was like, what about all the other options? And she started going to the options she researched and he was totally caught off guard because he probably wasn't prepared to face a patient like Jessica who had the medical background she did. And he was almost like shrank in the room as we were talking to him. I, and he was like, I, I made a big mistake. But um, yeah, it's just incredible. And it's a very unfortunate, it's very sad. It's very sad to know that all across the country, all across the world, doctors are saying this to people who have mm -hmm. no idea and think, that that's the best option. Um, you know, the really the only perceived benefit of termination at that point would be so maybe she, Jessica could do more testing, screening, possibly save her breast for more elaborate reconstruction. That's it. The, the possible, you know, the, the, the determination um, on the other side of it, like that's never talked about by those people. They don't even think about that part. And uh, that's sad. And, and, you know, I don't want to be on here demonizing physicians. There's so many incredible physicians out there, as many as there are who just go by the protocol and blindly say this culture of death rhetoric. There's so many really excellent ones. And mm -hmm. the, the, the lady who did Jessica's surgery was an incredible um, pro-life woman who, who wanted to treat Jessica and the baby. And we did find doctors who did want to treat Jessica and the baby. You just got to find mm -hmm. them. That's all. What was that treatment plan look? What did it look like for Jessica to have a pro-life treatment plan while she's suffering breast cancer, but she's also growing and nurturing Tommy, your youngest? Yeah. So um, just knowing that the doctor's got your back and is not going to try to suggest anything, you know, that, that just, just that in and of itself gave her that, you know, it made her relax. And then with armed with the knowledge that we had, we would, we would run by the options with each doctor and each doctor had different opinion. You know, maybe one doctor would say, maybe I wouldn't do chemo. Another doctor would say, I do chemo. I do this, you know, whatever. So ultimately with, with many different consults, many different opinions with these pro-life doctors, we came up with a plan that we'll, um, we'll do a few rounds of chemo while she had a few months left in the pregnancy. Um, because, um, well, I skipped the part where when she did the surgery, they found a 13 centimeter tumor and cancer all over her lymph nodes. After we found that, th then she was deemed basically terminal at that point, um, and that's when. Well, she's pregnant with Tommy. Right. So she she had the surgery um, January eighth, twenty twenty one. She still had about four months left of pregnancy, and when they found the tumor to be thirteen centimeters, forty three lymph nodes, positive, it basically indicated that most likely it's all over her organs, and um, so that's why we just ended up ultimately deciding to do the four rounds of chemo because um, that was an option we discussed if it, we needed to go there. She also did a, a whole revamp of her diet and um, did some non-pharmacological treatments the remainder of her pregnancy, but all was highly monitored. Uh, she was like highly, highly monitored uh, during it. And, um, you know, uh, personally at that point, she was, she was devastated, of course, but um, I was so just uh, inspired by her, how quickly she picked up her cross. I mean, she had her cross right there and she picked it up. She didn't hesitate right away. And, um, not only did she do that, she was, she was proclaiming our, you know, the goodness of our Lord during it. And I believe that's a big reason why the miracle was granted when ultimately Tommy was born and she did her scans and there was no cancer found anywhere. Wow. Cancer free after delivering Tommy. Yes. So Tommy uh, himself Incredible. was born. Yeah. He was born healthy, stills healthy to this day. Um, after going through his surgeries, all that uh, chemo, um, God protected him. Uh, God protected Jessica. And when Jessica had that miracle, um, she wasted no time again, proclaiming our Lord and his goodness. And, uh, she did many different talks around the country, different Catholic churches, just proclaiming, you know, uh, being a witness to, uh, accepting your cross and also a witness to, um, anybody who's, who's got, who's pregnant with cancer, uh, about, you know, the, the pro-life she spoke at Abby Johnson's pro-life conference mm -hmm. in June, 2022. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, many different people were touched by her witness in how she, um, you know, she stood up for life and, uh, and yeah. And so there, there was a good period of time after that, where she, she had clear scans for pretty much all of the year, 2022, mm -hmm. and she, um, was doing well and we were enjoying life. 
Lamar, I want to ask you about two moments during that first diagnosis that I want to kind of hear how Jessica responded and how you watched, how she responded during those moments. And then I want to talk about later on some of the struggles that she had, because I think so much of her journey that she did end up sharing on her Instagram, we're going to talk about that in a minute, was just so powerful for people to even watch her progression and just deep trust in our Lord. And so starting off when she had that surgery after the first diagnosis to remove some of the cancer and they discovered that she was terminal, that it had spread throughout her body. She's at this point, just a few months pregnant. You have three other children. How did she receive that news? How did that news hit you? So uh, behind the scenes, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little about behind the scenes and what she publicly posted literally, literally a day after her surgery, January 9th. It's still on her Instagram. Um, I personally, that, that we had a good cry. I remember after, um, we came home that day from the surgery, I myself personally just felt, you know, you feel that like, where do we go from here? Like the future is so uncertain at that point. You know, when, when I look back and my mind was just all over the place, like, how's the future going to look? Is our baby going to be okay? Is my wife going to be okay? How am I going to handle this? My other kids were so young still, all that goes through your head where, you know, the human nature fear and doubt. And, um, I would say, I, I don't think neither of us ever had any kind of anger towards God. It was more just, we had our moment of like grieving that news. And then it didn't take long. Maybe the, it was two days later, I believe we went to Sunday mass and we were just like, okay, what are, let's come up with a plan. Um, both spiritually and, you know, temporally, what do we do here? And, um, this is what she posted one day after her surgery. My walk to Calvary has begun. I am happy I'm being called to carry a cross and do something with it. I'm praying for the clarity on what that is exactly. Through suffering, I have never felt closer to God than I do now. He's trying to sanctify me. He expects more of me. He's helping me get there. So this was her mindset after the dust settled. And and mine as well. And, and we helped each other. I mean, we... Um, it's Again, I, I think it's supernatural grace. Like, this is where the supernatural graces come in when you can't explain it. And... Uh, I really can't explain how we were able to just pick up, you know, get back on our feet after that news and just keep going. I can't explain it. How did you explain it to the kids? They were, Jessica's diagnosis. Yeah, they were super young at that point. My oldest was only, um, six, he just turned six. All right, he wasn't even six, he was five. So we had like a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and then a one-year-old, barely. So they were super young. They didn't know what was going on. They were, um, you know, they were. We, we explained mommy's sick, but that's pretty much it. Uh, they really understood more as time went on, as the older ones got a little older. So after that diagnosis of that this is terminal, you have a battle plan together with Jessica. What did that look like? Was there a certain, I mean, you, you, you read her beautiful words in a disposition of her heart. What practically, what are some of the practical things that you guys did during that season while you're preparing to deliver Tommy? She's sick. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to, she's preparing for eternity. She believes she's terminal. She could be preparing for eternity here. Yeah, we um, we had a lot of support from family um, to help Jessica, her diet. She re completely revamped her diet. She went on a super clean diet um, daily. You know, she, she said often, like, my life has become a prayer. And this is true. We went, we went to as many different, uh, we, we were always in church. I mean, that, that's how I could best describe it. Like, we were always in church. Uh, in between her appointments, we'd always try to sneak in and go uh, get a blessing from a priest. or um, And it was tough. I mean, it was a daily thing. I mean, some days were harder than others. But uh, we, we tried our best to also, like, we would read. We'd do spiritual readings together. I remember that year, I believe, we did the um, Consecration of St. Joseph. And uh, there was a few other things we did together, like devotions together. We were doing the Way of the Cross um, devotion. And uh, th there were so many things. She just, it was like such a crash course for us during that time in just like suffering and how to um to move forward through suffering um and it really we relied completely on divine providence i mean we it was a lot of prayer a lot of prayer and hard prayer like intense prayer um but we were able to put our head like lay our head at night knowing god's in control and this mm -hmm. is his will and um again that was just the beginning of many other times we had to do that same thing uh, looking back at that time, uh, it, it was no different than what we did, you know, when she was in the last months, what I've been doing now, mm -hmm. it ultimately comes down to, uh, when you, when you get to a point where you realize how fleeting this life is and how, um, 
suffering is temporal. There's always an end to suffering, but eternity's forever. And, you know, the thought that none of us make it out of here alive, uh, we, we all we all have to prepare the most important part of our most important time of our life, most important event is our judgment and keeping our particular judgment ahead of us every day. Uh, St. Alphonsus de Liguori, Preparation for Death, excellent book resource for that. Um, that was one thing we both read cover to cover during that time. Um, also uh, on YouTube, the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Um, I highly, highly recommend. During that time, uh, th there was Father Isaac Mary Aurelier on YouTube. He was he does great reflections on death, judgment, heaven, and hell, and um, no holds barred, no, no, no sugar coating. And it's, it's excellent because it just, when you have that perspective, it actually, for me personally and for Jessica, it helped us suffer better because we, we know like that we're going somewhere. It's not, we're just not sitting here being tortured. Um, and yeah, there was, there was a mental battle going on. Like we didn't know if she had cancer everywhere or not. We had to basically trust in our Lord fully for like four months before he was born and trust that our baby's going to be healthy. And, but to get your mind. And is that because you, just to clarify, that's because you delayed scans, you, additional scans to protect Tommy? Right. You, you, yeah, it's not, it's, it, you just can't scan when you're pregnant. Um, you can't do the scans mm -hmm. to do the full diagnosis when you're pregnant. That's precisely why, the, that's a primary reason why the, the, those other doctors suggest termination. Um, so in a way, you know, you're exercising trust because, because essentially the, the thought process is terminate the baby. It's horrible to say that. Terminate the baby. Uh, scan the woman and then treat the woman, right? Completely disregarding the baby. So, um, so we, we, you know, you forego that. And, um, again, Jessica, we, when we did, when we found out like how big the tumor was and, and how many lymph nodes are involved, that's why we, she wasn't initially not going to do the, ke the chemo, but we did the chemo because the doctors were telling us this could be everywhere. And, you know, just to give her a fighting shot, not knowing. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of trust in our Lord. Um, and it was by doing that, those exercises and trust, with our Lord, you, uh, it prepares you again for future battles, which we did end up facing. Mm. How did you and Jessica navigate fears or anxieties about your kids? You have three really little ones at home. You're about to deliver your fourth. She's terminally ill. I'm sure there was a lot of mental struggle and emotional struggle around caring for those kids and the future that those kids might have. Yeah. You know, the, the, the biggest thing is to, to understand is these children, God entrusts these children to us as parents, but they're not our children. They're our Lord's children. Mm -hmm. um, the this, this scripture passage about the birds, how our Lord takes care of the birds. And, and, and that, that's a big win for us because we knew that our Lord will take care of us somehow. We just knew somehow we'd be taken care of. And that's kind of what I'm doing now, to be honest. Um, I'm sitting here as a widow, widower, as a widower, and my future looks so uncertain right now on paper. But eternally, I know God has, it will take care of me and God will take care of my children. I mean, anybody who's been in my shoes knows that when you have, when you're a single parent, your, your routines are gone. Missing a mom is so huge in a home. There's so much that goes into the loss, but you still, at the end of the day, have that trust. You have to have that trust that our Lord is in control of everything. And so that's what it boils down to. That's really it knowing that these are our Lord's children and he is in control of everything, no matter how things look. And I often, uh, I love the passion of the Christ. It's my favorite movie. Um, and I love it because it's so real. I love it because it's the most realistic depiction, I believe of our Lord's crucifixion. And in that movie, it gets ugly. As you know, if you've anybody who's seen it, it gets ugly. And to be honest, that reflecting on that ugliness of the suffering helps me because suffering is ugly. Suffering can get ugly. But look at the glory that came afterwards. I mean, um, so as ugly as suffering can get, as uncertain as it can get, as dark as it can get, there's always glory if you participate in our Lord's will and pick up your cross and keep going. And what did our Lord do? He picked up, picked up his cross, kept going, even though there was bones hanging out, even though there was flesh coming out, even though, it was, you know, and the passion didn't even do it justice of what really happened. So reflecting on our Lord's passion too is a big help. And that, that really, Jessica, especially with the physical pain she went through, she really reflected a lot on her passion and she posts a lot about that on her page, especially towards the end when she was going through physical pain. The mental anguish that we had during that time was more mental than physical, I would say. But um, either way, it's suffering and, and you just have to keep going one foot in front of the other, trusting in our Lord, no matter how ugly or dark it gets, no matter how bleak it looks. And that's, that's something that, uh, that's the way we were able to get through it.
It can be so difficult to pray in the busyness and craziness of our lives. And that's why I love tools and resources that help us make prayer a daily part of our lives. That's why I love Hallow. Hallow is the world's number one prayer app with millions of people joining in. On Hallow, you're gonna find over 10,000 prayers. You're gonna find daily scripture, meditations, sleep stories, content for kids, and so much more. Starting in July, there will be a special Witness to Hope series, a meditation on the life of St. John Paul II, guided by Jim Caviezel, Monsignor Shea, and Jackie Angel. Want to dive deeper into Holy Scripture? Check out Hallow. Want to make guided prayer sessions a part of your daily routine? Check out Hallow. Hallow has got you covered. Download Hallow at the link in the description today for three months free. That's the link in the description. You can download Hallow for three months free. When she discovered she was fully cancer-free after Tommy was born, you guys had a year, uh, give or take, of just peace. I mean, there wasn't cancer hanging over her head and your head in the same way. What was it like navigating that year and then finding out when the cancer was back? You know, that year of 2022, I'll look back on, cherish so many memories. Um, it was such a beautiful year. We, we, we lived pretty normally that year. It was the last pretty much normal year we had. We went on a vacation. We, um, and meanwhile, Jessica was like evangelizing people, thousands of people across the world, but she was still made, made time to, you know, really enjoy. We enjoyed our time together as husband and wife. We went on, we, we, uh, you know, our 10 year anniversary honeymoon, everything we did, um, together. I cherish, I cherish it so much. And especially these days. Um, and when it came back, you know, in a way, we were sad, but it was different. It was different than the first time because we'd been through something before. The trial that we were in before a year and a half earlier strengthened us uh, or, or prepared us, I would say. Prepared us. It still wasn't easy. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty, but uh, the way it all happened was pretty gradual. I mean, 2023, most of the year was spent either in hospital or she wasn't 100%. It, the cancer came into her lungs, then it eventually went to her bones and then her heart. Um, the last, the first three months of 2024 leading up to her death, she was mostly in hospital. Um, we didn't anticipate that it was going to happen that way, but with cancer, you just, any, any cancer patient will tell you, you just, it's a very unpredictable uh, journey. She had a very mm -hmm. aggressive cancer. Um, she had a PALB2 mutation, which is a very specific mutation that, um, where, where you're pretty much fighting an uphill battle. And, if, you know, we always knew that the possibility of cancer coming back was there. We always knew that. And Jessica, because she knew that, that's why she never ceased her page. That's why she didn't just stop uh, her page when she was feeling good. She kept going. She kept trying to do our Lord's will because she, in the back of her mind, knew, and I knew too, as cancer often does, it can come back. When you guys, after you had that beautiful year and then you first discovered the cancer was back, what was that like? How did, what was the emotional and spiritual state you guys were in when you got that news that this, this year of kind of peace and quiet is done and yeah. now we're back in the fight? tears. Uh, Jessica was very frustrated at first, you know, your human nature takes over and she was frustrated. And she definitely had her moments where she was like, why God, you know, she definitely had those moments. And so did I. Um, I'm not going to sit here and act like we didn't, we definitely did. We definitely had moments of frustration. We definitely had, it was a tough, tough, like to, to take that news, you know, to know that, okay, the good time, you know, the break is over and now you're back at it. Uh, because it was so good. It was so nice to have that year where everything was normal. But ultimately, um, I would say the thing that helped us the most kind of move past that was understanding and accepting that heaven is our home. This isn't our home. And um, I think from that point on, Jessica's, Jessica's mission uh, shifted from preparation, from suffering to suffering and preparation for death. Even though she didn't know when she was going to die, a lot of the content she posted was around that preparation for death. And in a way, it was, it was, a, it was a somber thing to talk about, but also it was, it was a beautiful thing because a lot of people nowadays don't want to talk about that. And, uh, we live in a, unfortunately in a modernist, um, church of nice, which, which, you know, we, we don't like to talk about the hard things. Um, the church of nice, that was from, um, Harrison Butker's speech. Highly recommend anybody read that <laughs> excellent speech. But, um, yeah, we, we, we really, um, she really dove into preparing, preparing for death when that happened and that whole year. And the talks we would have personally would be around that. She almost talked as if she was going to die. And I, I often didn't, like, it was uncomfortable to talk about. And, and in the back of my mind, I was consoling her, but I was, like, sad. As anybody who's been a caregiver would know, that's a challenge, a pretty pretty common challenge where your, your dying spouse or suffering spouse 
we'll talk about death, but you yourself would want to keep that. You know, we always prayed for a miracle. We always continue to pray for healing, but we also wanted to be prepared. So that, that really, how did you, sorry, how did you navigate that with the kids? The kids are a little older now. Did you tell them the cancer was back? How did you make decisions about what to include the kids on? Yeah, so we were wide open with the kids. They fully knew um, everything at that point. Um, especially when she went in, and it was uh, May, May 2023 last year. She was in hospital for a couple of months. That was the first time they really saw her physically at a brink, you know. I mean, even leading up to that March, April 2023, she was starting to like, even on her own birthday in March, she was almost, she was in the hospital that day. But uh, the kids started, you know, after these, again, when you speak about openly about the faith with the kids, and, and you also talk about the four last things with the kids, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Um, the, these kids, they, they want to learn these things. They want to absorb them. And, and they just, almost like it became just matter of fact, they were talking about it. And they get sad to see mom in the hospital. You know, she's not participating in these events anymore. Initially, it was sad for them. Uh, and I talked to them. And then after time went on, they almost got uh, accustomed to the fact, okay, mommy's sick and um, this is what we're going to, this is what, just what we're living with. And then it was really towards the end of or the beginning of 2024 this year, where the possibility of death was, was actually imminent that, that then I was starting to really prepare them myself. I'd have to talk to them about that. It's, and, and I'd say, you know, uh, mommy could be meeting Jesus soon. And uh, this is possible. And I would always talk to them about it. And the more I talked to them about it, the better, because, you know, they weren't caught off guard when it ended up happening. And uh, they were, again, I think mentally prepared, spiritually prepared. And that's so important because I believe if, if it was, and we had the, that was a grace actually from God, you know, I believe it's a grace from God um, to have, to be able to prepare for your death and to prepare for a loved one's mm -hmm. death. There's so many cases I know of sudden deaths and that's so heartbreaking. And my heart goes out to those people because I can't imagine being like hit with grief suddenly, you know, car accidents or heart attacks going through what I'm going through now. That's like an additional trauma, I believe. And, um, but so, so in a way we had that as it was a grace from God for Jessica and for us to prepare gradually for it. And, um, and yeah, that, that's, that, that, that's what I would say we, we did with the kids, just keeping an open line of communication at all times. Jessica's Instagram account has reached millions of people. It, her videos have been viewed millions of times. And she basically chronicled her fight with cancer. And she called the Instagram account blessed by cancer, mm. which I think to a lot of people is a foreign concept to be blessed by such a ugly disease that can kill you. Why did she call it blessed by cancer? And what was Jessica's heart behind this Instagram account and the content that she was creating throughout her suffering? Yeah, so so that, that that that's come up quite a bit, you know. There's been people, a lot, there'll be people, non-Catholics, even Catholics, secular people. How can you call cancer a blessing? You know, to answer, to really understand this question, you really have to understand the Catholic faith, the true, the the basic teachings of the Catholic faith. Um, obviously, cancer is not a blessing, but um, like I said before, from an eternal perspective, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Um, if we accept the church teachings from old that teach us that most will not be saved and you, you really reflect on the four last things, that's when you could, and, and then you reflect on suffering, that's when you start to understand it. St. John Chrysostom, for example, talks about Constantinople when it was a Christian city. And he says, out of this thickly populate, populated city with thousands of inhabitants, not 100 people will be saved. I even doubt there will be as many as that. So St. John Chrysostom, is saying out of thousands, not even a hundred would be saved. That's just the truth that many people, again, in this, this church of nice, this modernist church that we have, unfortunately, it's not being preached. And um, if we come at it from that lens and also from the lens of heaven and hell, um, if you do, if you look at, you know, think about heaven and hell, we're all gonna end up in heaven and hell. And then you have the suffering. Suffering is temporal. There's an end to it. Heaven and hell, there's no end. So if, if by our cross, it becomes the ladder to heaven, if suffering, uh, suffering then can be seen as a blessing from God and um, because God wants to separate us from this world to detach us from worldly and human consolation because his consolation is a lot greater. He wants to give us so much more than human consolation. So you reflect on all that. You, you really understand that and then you can understand why 
It's called blessed by cancer because from an eternal perspective, that's exactly what Jessica did. She separated herself from human constellation. And now she's in a place where I like to believe she's, she's in heaven. And uh, she's in a place happier than I could ever make her, you know? And that's just, that's just the truth. Um, and how did she get there? She picked up her cross and followed our Lord. She suffered the right way. And um, again, uh, I feel like this day and age, it's just unfortunately, people are on two ends of the spectrum. Either they're too much relying on divine mercy leading to lukewarmness and presumption, or they're too much relying on divine mm -hmm. justice leading to despair and scruples. Uh, I think you can't be in either of these extremes to understand the faith. You have to understand that our Lord is is merciful, but he's also just. And that's what Jessica preached a lot too. And, and that's just the truth. And so we must uh, attain our uh, salvation in fear and trembling. And, you know, you have all that in mind. Cancer ended up being a blessing for Jessica's soul. For us suffering, left on earth, suffering her children, myself, now we have our cross. And, you know, this is now my ladder to heaven. This is our children's ladder to heaven. Um, suffering is, again, such a short period of time. St. John Vianney says, why stop suffering now? Think of all the souls out there that I have to make reparation for so they can save their souls. Mm -hmm. um, St. Augustine, our Lo O Lord, enable me to see more and more into the misery of this life that I may thus be urged to strive for freedom and glory in the kingdom. Uh, Jessica herself, April 8th, she says, cancer did not rob me. God chose to take my story on a massive detour and I trust it's for the ultimate good and his own glory. So uh, again, her story is one of, she, she conquered, she, she was able to figure it out, Jessica did, I believe. And she, show, she showed thousands and millions of people, like you said, there's a way, you know, there's a way through suffering, not to run away from it, but to face it head on. And the way through, again, it's the ladder to heaven. That's what I believe. And that's, what, that's what's taught by our church, basic teachings. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. so for, for a secular or a non-Catholic or even a Catholic who just doesn't really understand the faith, that blessed by cancer wouldn't make sense. But if you really understand, if you really dive into it and reflect on it, then it would make sense. What was the what were some of the graces that you saw evident in your wife? You've talked about peace and, and trust in our Lord, but are there is there any other maybe a moment where you saw, wow, the grace is really real for us yeah. during that suffering? So Jessica, if, if someone was to tell me, describe Jessica in one sentence, I'd say an extraordinarily talented woman with a heart of gold who completely abandoned her will, united it with our Lord's. And this is how she helped thousands across the world strengthen their faith. She was so talented. Anybody who ever met this woman, um, just natural. She was a natural, she, had a, she was funny. She was smart. She was, um, God gave her so much. She, was, she, 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 she would be able to whip up these Instagram reels within seconds, just boom, boom, boom. And now that I'm managing her Instagram, I, I have more appreciation for what she did. Um, what she did though, that, that, I saw with my very own eyes, knowing her for 12 years. See, that's the thing. A lot of people seen her at the end of her life when she reached that level of holiness, but I saw her her whole life and I saw the transformation and those talents she had from the beginning, um, you know, were used for business, were used for being social and socializing and enjoying life. But then she used those talents for God. Seeing that, seeing a woman use her talents and give them all to God and then seeing what happens when you do that, she's just proof mm -hmm. that any talent you might have, if you give it to our Lord and do his will perfectly, as perfect as you can, incredible things can happen. And that's what happened here. Um, you know, she didn't complain much she, with her suffering. She, she did every, everything she could to offer up her suffering. Um, and then again, like I said before, she showing us how to uh, prepare for death. Um, you know, um, it's not about how you start, but how you finish. And that's something that we should all keep in mind, no matter how far you've fallen, um, no matter where you are in your spiritual life right now, look to Jessica as an example of someone who, again, we went like, when from the time we met as Catholics in name only to the end, it was just an incredible transformation with my own eyes that I witnessed. And it's, that inspires me till, till this day to, uh, you know, to continue. I mean, look at St. Augustine, look at St. Paul, our Lord never gives up. Um, on any, any soul and, and any soul at any moment can, can choose to become a saint. And that's what Jessica did. Um, I just, we just have to remember to participate with, uh, by remaining in, in state of grace and committing to prayer. And, um, we have to do the hard work. It's hard work. That's the thing. And, and Jessica made it look easy, 
but it's not easy. It's very hard work. And uh, I got a lot of appreciation for that too, especially now that I've been three months into this journey of being, uh, of being widowed, uh, that I, I, I just have more appreciation even more now about what she did. She had so much to say and she wrote so much throughout her Blessed by Cancer Instagram account. And then when she would give talks or she would otherwise communicate, are there any other things that she said or would say that you remember that you want to share? Well, the big, the big uh, thing that she became famous for was Onward. Uh, that was her phrase. Mm-hmm. Enoch, shout out to Enoch. He did a great, beautiful song, tribute to her. Beautiful song. I'll check it out uh, on YouTube. Uh, she, that, that phrase, just that, just that word onward. Um, because so many times we got knocked down. I mean, there were so many times we had bad news, bad news from the doctor, bad news. Uh, she had a setback. She had, uh, there was so many times I can't even count, but what we did, our, our motto was, you know, you can, you, you fall down, but it's all about how you get back up and This is what I'm going through right now. And this is what sticks with me the most because, um, she, I know that that's, that's what she would want me to do right now. When I have my tough days, um, you know, to experience them, to let, feel the grief, but then she would also want me to move, move onward. And, and because, you know, really onward is not just about moving onward because as long as God has you on this earth, as long as you're breathing, he wants something from you. And, um, even though Jessica's not here, there's still many millions around the world suffering millions around the world who need prayers who are lost spiritually in spiritual battles the devil the enemy doesn't sleep and uh we must always be on guard and prepared and and that's what really what onward means to me is is there's so much at stake there's so much at stake so many souls at stake we you know i can't just sit here and wallow and um when i have four souls that depend on me and and with her page too speaking of her page um you know, that's the, something I've adopted now as carrying on her page because it's still helping a lot of people. And there's still many people who need mm-hmm. prayers, many people who need, who are suffering still. And that didn't stop. And so um, that's the biggest thing I got from Jessica is is to keep going forward no matter how bleak, again, no matter. And that's that, that inspiration that she got, she gave came from the cross, came from our Lord's passion. If you really meditate on our Lord's passion, like I said, it's ugly and... Um, You just, you have to keep going. You have to keep going. That's what he did. Our Lord kept going. And, uh, that's what I have to do. And that's, that's what I encourage. That's the message, really the the core message of, of, of what Jessica taught is, is to keep going no matter what and trust in our Lord. Mm -hmm. Are there any stories that you've heard since Jessica started her account and especially after her passing now of people and how her words, her example have impacted them? Hundreds of stories. I can't too much to go into. Um, I, I like by keeping her page alive, I've been getting messages, um, constantly and, uh, around from around the world. It's pretty incredible. It's incredible to see what she did. And, uh, the one I can, any, has any stuck out to you? Well, there was, a, there was one who, uh, wasn't, wasn't literally an atheist who is completely into her faith right now because of, of Jessica's mm-hmm. witness. Uh, many people who are suffering with cancer at, uh, really connected with Jessica, and, um, yeah, I would say probably there, there's, yeah, I, too many to go into, but yeah, the, probably the atheist was the one that just popped into my mind now. Um, it, it's just so inspiring. It's so inspiring to see again, a woman use her talents, giving it to God. And it's literally helping God through her, God through Jessica changed thousands of people's lives. Hmm. Amazing. And Lamar, how has it been since her passing? You've been sharing, beginning to share about your grief and about your experience now being a widower with these beautiful kids. How has that been like for you? I know it's pretty fresh still, and I so appreciate you coming on the show to talk about it, but what has that experience been like for you? Yeah. So, um, first and foremost, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, I, I'm just a sinner. I'm just a sinner like everybody else. And, um, and I, I humbly say this because I, I just, you know, I feel like God has putting me this for through, the, through this for a reason. Um, it's not easy and, you know, there's no way around it. It's extremely difficult. Um, when you're married with someone 12 years, you become one person, you literally become one flesh. And now all of a sudden you got to relearn who you are. I'm not the same person I was uh, when I first met Jessica. 
Um, many things trigger me in sadness. The grief comes and goes in waves like anybody who's been through it knows. Uh, you just have to fight through it somehow with God's grace. And um, I, I, again, I, I'm not the first, I'm not the last to go through this. I like to, you know, perspective helps a lot. You know, um, I've, I've joined a lot of these widow, widow, widower groups just reading what people are going through. And there's a lot of people going through much harder than me. And that's helped me give me some perspective. And I've been able to actually talk to some people who are going through things and, and tougher circumstances than mine. Um, God gave me these four incredible angels. Um, he gave me so many graces to get through it. Um, again, I'm not the first, I'm not the last to go through it. Um, I, <clears throat> I, I would say that one of the biggest graces God gave me to get through this is Jessica's content herself. I've, I've actually at night, um, in the beginning, I was having a hard time when I put the kids to bed. Night times are the hardest. Anybody who has young kids knows the kids have been a blessing. But then when you put them to bed, it's quiet. I would actually, I would actually be extremely sad. But then I would start um, reading her content. And I went from the very beginning. And I picked up so much from her content. And then I decided, you know what? I believe Jessica would want me to continue this page. And I did. And I started posting monthly updates of myself and uh, what I'm going through. And then I started getting the feedback uh, of people who, who appreciated me sharing that. And then I realized, Hey, you know, maybe I can continue what Jessica did here. Maybe I can be a witness to how to suffer through this kind of suffering. It's a different kind of suffering that Jessica went through, but there's many people going through this and maybe I can just continue what she did. You know, we made a great team in business when she was on earth and maybe now we can continue to be a great team. And she kind of <laughs> passed the baton on to me. Um, and we can, do something with this and keep it going. Um, I really believe mm -hmm. if, if I if I can get more eyes on her page, then so many more people could benefit from it. Uh, and so I feel like I do have this mission, which which is it's such a grace to help me get through this because I feel like I have a purpose, I have a mission here, and uh, it's really simply just to proclaim the goodness of God through suffering. God is great; He's in control. Um, he's always good. He was good before this. He's good now. He's good after. Um, and He will give everybody the graces you need to get through anything. And so. If I could proclaim that, if I could, if I could just keep her mission going on somehow, if it be our Lord's will, if he would use a sinner like me to do that, then that's amazing. Um, in the process, my main mission is to save my soul, to save my children's soul, to continue. The, the, the primary mission we had as parents was to get our kids to heaven. Um, I'd like to think that Jessica's in heaven, like I said. So in a way, I, I accomplished one of my missions, um, and she made it easy for me, for sure. But um, I... Uh, you know, I still have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. It's a daily battle. Like I said, the mm -hmm. enemy doesn't sleep. And when I'm down, when you're down in grief, it's it's such a, it's so easy. It's very tempting to go down that dark path of thoughts. But thanks to my faith, thanks to all the things I mentioned earlier, uh, I can fall back on that. And that's really what it comes down to, focusing on our Lord's, uh, our Lord on Calvary, our Lord's passion, and how he kept going and he kept going. And um, that's that's what I have to do. Um, as far as my children go, they've been incredible. Um, you know, they, they still go, they, they go, they're in grief counseling. They see me cry all the time. They cry at times. I'm with them. I'm, I tell them it's okay to cry. With all that said, though, uh, it's been three months. I would say that they've consoled me the more than I've consoled them. And it's pretty incredible, you know. When we go to the tomb after Jessica's mass on Sunday, every Sunday, um, it's usually me, the one who's bawling, and then they're the ones hugging me. It's, it's so beautiful how our Lord works through these young, innocent souls. And, and, um, but yeah, they, they still, you know, just like any, any child going through this, they're going to have their days and, uh, I'm always there for them. And, uh, I have to just rely purely on divine providence at this point. Like I said earlier, I don't know how my future looks. I don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty, mm -hmm. but no matter what, no matter what, I will always proclaim God's goodness. And I will always proclaim mm -hmm. how I, I'm, I'm living proof that he's with me as I'm carrying this cross. He is with me. And, um, and that's mainly why I wanted to come on here, Lila, to be honest, to give glory to God. That's it. I'm the only reason, uh, he's the only reason I'm here. I'm sitting here right now. And uh, when people tell me, oh, you know, you seem like you're doing good. It's not, it's not easy, you know, but it's all, all glory to God. That's the only thing. I, again, not, not explainable, supernatural graces. You can't explain it. But um, yeah, that's all I can say. Well, I think you are inspiring so many people, Lamar, to deep in their love of and their walk with God. That's what Jessica did in her life. That's what you're doing in yours. And I thank you. Thank you for doing that. 
and for being willing to be vulnerable and share with other people. Cause a lot of people now is not the time they want to be getting on a podcast. So I so appreciate it. And I know how edifying this is for people that have already encountered Jessica's story and for the folks listening to this podcast now. All glory to God. St. Augustine said, uh, one of my favorite quotes from St. Augustine is, any good that comes from me, uh, I, I, oh, I'm going to paraphrase it, but um, any good coming from me is from God and the rest is my fault. And that's that's what I always proclaim. Any good coming from <laughs> me is all God. And uh, anytime anybody give me anything, any kind of praise, I give it right back to our Lord. Mm. Amen. There's one more thing I wanted to hear you share about, and I think it's such an incredibly important thing for people to learn as we ourselves are all on our journey towards eternity. And that's this idea of preparing for a holy death. I know you mentioned earlier, Jessica really felt in her last few months as she was suffering that she was preparing for her death and she wanted to help other people prepare for a holy death. Can you share more what it means to prepare for a holy death, what this idea is? And then if you're willing, share about the, the circumstances of Jessica's passing. Yeah, so... Um... It's, uh, you know, it, it comes, it starts with, to start preparing for death, you have to start to want to face it. I mean, most of society doesn't want to talk about death. We have, we live in a very, um, you know, uh, sanitized life right now where, you know, death isn't, is kind of like pushed aside or not talked about, um, cause people don't want to deal with it. People don't want to think about it. And it's pretty incredible that, like I said earlier, your, your biggest moment of your entire existence is your particular judgment with our Lord. And most people don't even want to reflect on that. So I think it starts with reflecting on the fact that you will be judged the moment you die. We believe as Catholics that you will be before the throne of God, judged for every action, every thought, every word, every deed, your, your, everything you did and everything you didn't do. And that's a scary thought for many people. Um, but that's where it starts. So if you, if you start on that, and, and again, you could be motivated by fear, like I said, but it's best to be motivated by fear and for love of God as well. It, it's best not to be too extremes. Again, not too much divine, to rely on divine mercy, not too much to rely on divine justice. That's what I believe. So first step is really reflecting on your judgment. Really, um, you know, I would say start out with a um, general confession. A general confession, confessing all your sins. And, and Jessica and I did this uh, a few times um, because you really want to get right with God before you get on this journey of preparing for death. Second step after that, I would say, um, just to understand how, you know, to, to really reflect on how death can happen at any moment. Um, you know, we ha when you, when you know somebody as intimately as I do, and then you see them die before your eyes, like I said, it, it, it sounds weird, but it's actually a grace. It's a grace. It's a supernatural grace that it, because it, it, it helps you prepare for your own death. Um, it, and so Jessica, in her terminal illness, I mean, when you're told you're terminal, that, that for her, that was her almost like, okay, you're almost like forced in a corner and like you're faced with it and you have to, you know? And so for us who are not faced with the terminal illness and go day to day, it's very tempting to just go about your life and not think about that very important moment. Um, and then, you, you know, and so again, reflecting on the four last things, like I said, um, death, judgment, heaven, and hell that will give you graces to prepare for a holy death because you see all of the outcomes from, you know, from those moments, those very crucial moments. Um, the church teaches that the enemy is going to come at you hard at those last moments. Um, but, you know, there are also many, many gifts given from our Lord and many devotions to help you prepare for a holy death. And I, it's too many that I can get into right now. But once, you, once one starts diving into their faith, you'll learn these things and you'll learn, okay, you know, and, and it'll give you that peace of mind that, okay, I'm doing what I can. Death is such a scary thing. It's such an unknown thing. We as humans, nobody can say that they've experienced it, obviously. What's behind the veil, we don't know. But it, 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 it relies, then, you know, going from that, doing your homework, then it, then it comes down to trust. You really have to trust in our Lord that if you did what you were supposed to do, not only him, but our lady and all the saints and everybody, everybody who you... Um, you know, call to during your life will be there at your hour of your death and help you die gracefully. And, and one of Jessica's posts too, and specifically there's, you know, getting the last rites and the viaticum. And there's, a, there's actually a post Jessica made um, just a couple months before she died about the things uh, as Catholics to have in, you know, ready to go before you die. There's those things as well. 
Um, but really, it comes down to uh, just, I think the first step is just facing it. You have to face it. And it's, again, most people who are probably listening to this wouldn't want to think about their own death or face it or think about a loved one dying, possibly. But um, as far as, as Jessica's passing, uh, it was, she died peacefully with family around. Um, she, her cancer spread, uh, so it came back in her, like I said, her lungs, heart, bone, and then eventually it went leptomeningeal. Once it gets leptomeningeal, it's the fluid around the brain, you only have hours or days. And uh, so she kind of lost consciousness at the end, and it was a peaceful death. Um, she just died peacefully. And it was so reassuring to me knowing that she was so prepared. And that's the one thing you can do for your loved ones is if you prepare for death gracefully, you can reassure your loved ones when that time happens. Because as it is, it's such a hard moment. It's such a horrible moment, difficult moment, sad moment. But the one thing that consoled all of us, me and her siblings and her mom and my family, one thing that consoled us and even her friends and a lot of her followers is that this woman was so prepared for death. Her priest who gave her her, her um, last rites told me, I don't think I've ever met anyone that prepared. And that gave me so much consolation because, you know, again, I can, I can confidently know that, you know, and we don't presume anybody's in heaven. And I even made a post about it, how we should all still pray for her. And, that, and she even made a post about it when she was alive to continue to pray for me no matter what. And I still do. I still pray to Jessica. I pray for Jessica if she's still in purgatory, but I believe that she's in heaven. And a lot of people do as well. And, um, but no matter what, she prepared herself. This woman prepared herself. And that's the biggest gift you can give to your loved ones before you go. As not, not only as an example, but that reassurance. And that was so huge. And it helps me, you know, it helps me confidently ask for her intercession now. Um, mm -hmm. whether, in, whether in purgatory or in heaven, she could still intercede for me mm -hmm. and the kids. And I do it all the time. I speak to her all the time and it helps me. It helps me a lot. And so knowing all that, with all that said, I know what I need to do now um, for my children one day, when the day, you know, like I said, nobody makes it out of here alive. Some people seem to think we do, but nobody makes it here out of here alive. So when the day comes for me to, to, to help my family, you know, I'm going to do what I have to do to help console them knowing that I did everything I can. And this is part of it is just, um, living the faith as best as I can and getting up when I fall and, and going onward, like Jessica said, onward, uh, to, to heaven. Lamar, have there been any conversations about considering opening a cause for Jessica's canonization in the future? Yeah, so she has a, a couple followers who have been, there's actually an email, and I apologize, I don't have the email handy, but there's an email one of her followers created where people are sending their conversion stories or potential intercession stories to, and she's collecting it. Um, there's also uh, been discussions. There's also been uh, some of those sent to me privately on, uh, via DM on Instagram. And um, definitely it's something in the back of my mind, uh, but I wouldn't say it's at the forefront. If God wills it, it'll happen. If not, it won't. And that's pretty much as simple as that. You know, I don't really think too much about that. Um, but if, it, if, it, if he wills it, it will happen. And so uh, another reason why I want to continue her mission and her legacy and, her, and honor her as much as I can is because if that were to happen, you know, I might not be around for that, but my kids most likely will. Mm -hmm. So I want to leave them, you know, I want to kind of leave them with all the tools they need if that time comes to, um, to know as much as they can about their mom and, uh, and what she did. And, um, and yeah, so definitely it's something that's been talked about. And, uh, but again, I, I, I leave all that to God at, at this point in my life. I don't think too far ahead, Lila. I do one day <laughs> at a time. Um, and I know God will provide. Thank you, Lamar. Thank you so much for making time to do this with me. I know you've got a lot on your plate right now. And how can people find Jessica's Instagram? And is there any other resources that you recommend to people that you think Jessica would want them to discover or find? Right now, uh, all we have is the Instagram. It's blessed underscore by underscore cancer. So blessed underscore by underscore cancer. That's on Instagram. There's a YouTube channel we started, but we don't have any content on there yet. I'm hiring somebody who's mm -hmm. going to put all of her content from Instagram onto YouTube. Um, awesome. And I also would say this, that I have plans in the works, different plans of how to continue her page, keep it alive. I do repost prayer requests. I do updates myself. Um, I and, and there's other more elaborate plans that are going to be down the pipeline at some point too. Um, I have other plans in the works, which I, I can't reveal now, but um, as far as things she would, you know, it's all on her Instagram, actually. If you go on her Instagram, 
she has all of her resources there. She did such a good job organizing it. Um, like I said, she was so, so talented and so good at that. And um, she pretty much made it easy for me. I mean, she, it's all there. So uh, <laughs> as far as anything else that I will find, I will always share it as I continue her page. Um, what helps me, you know, because what helps me might be different than what helps her. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. But I would highly, highly recommend anybody going through any kind of suffering right now, blessed by cancer, go on Instagram and start reading her story from the beginning. It's a lot of content. It takes time to go through. But if you're in a hospital bed or if you're if you got a lot of time on your hands, it's some great reading. Thank you so much, Lamar. Thanks, Lila. Thanks for having me. Godspeed. We'll be praying for you. And I'll ask my audience too to pray for you and pray with you for all of the souls that need the prayers. Thanks, Lila. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast with Lamar Hanna. I hope that was encouraging and edifying for you the way that it was for me. Check out Lamar continuing Jessica's legacy on our Instagram account, Blessed by Cancer. And please share this podcast. Share it with someone that you know who might be struggling, who might be suffering, who might need some extra encouragement and some extra hope to be reminded that we are all together on a journey to prepare for eternity. And a huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest Catholic network in the world, reaching millions with entertainment, news, and more. Check them out at EWTN.com.